everybody welcome to our first or i guess the last um webinar of the year in regards to and now today we have a special guest his name is hayden Fulty, uh and he's with benchmark insurance and i think one of the issues that has come up quite a bit is in regards to protecting your rental property uh you know during covid during this i guess pandemic as you could say but you know being in houston uh we do feel pretty normal uh just a little bit about myself. I am the broker and owner of Property Care. Uh, we are a single family property management company here in Houston. Uh, at the moment, we manage a little bit over 400 properties. Uh, we, I started in real estate investing in single family homes back in 2011. So doesn't, I feel pretty young. I feel like I look pretty young, um, but I've, you know, I'm almost, been a decade in since I first bought my rental property, my first rental property back uh, in 2011. Uh, I am a licensed real estate agent or broker uh, with within Texas. Um, you know, originally I was, I, I got my accounting degree from University of Houston. Uh, I am a licensed CPA in Houston. Uh, and no further ado, I'm going to uh, present Haytham and give him a moment and let him talk about himself. Hello, everyone. My name is Haytham Fodi. I am with Benchmark Insurance Group. Uh, we have been in business for over 16 years. I have about 15 years of insurance experience. You know, we've been through all the hurricanes, all the tropical storms, uh, and I feel like we have a good grasp on, on the purpose of insurance and, and you know, the, the things you need to master and, and need to know uh, when filing a claim and um, and how to maximize on your insurance when you actually do need it. Uh, I'd say we're really, really good at, at negotiating your rates down better than the average agency. Uh, so we're working every year to try, uh, drive your costs down uh, and not taking these massive increases. Um, and we offer claims consulting for all of our clients. So we're going to walk you through that entire process. Um, I am also a real estate investor, uh, bought my first deal it was a single family home burn house back, you know, I think eight years ago, seven years ago. Um, and you know, now we're doing a little bit of multifamily. I have a couple retail shopping centers as well. Uh, so I am an investor and I understand insurance from an investor standpoint, um, which, you know, is beneficial for someone looking for insurance. Uh, and a fun fact is that I play the saxophone, uh, which is, could be kind of weird, I guess. Um, but yeah, played that for, for over 10 years as well. 10 years. Bit, right? So you didn't start when you were like a little kid, you just decided to pick up the saxophone as an adult. I, no, I started in middle school through high school and I still have a saxophone. Let me put it that way. Okay. <laughs> All right. That one day you woke up as an adult and was like, you know, I really want to play the saxophone. No. Um, so, you know, I wanted to add that for my own insurance purposes, for my rental properties, uh, for my personal home, I do use Benchmark. So he is someone that I use uh, for my own insurance purposes. Uh, beyond rental properties, uh, Haytham, you know, you guys do the insurance for my, uh, my vehicles, for my company. So I have three commercial leases with Benchmark. So I think you guys do more than just property, right? You do business and like vehicle insurance also. That is correct. We, we do it all. We do home, we do auto, rental properties. Uh, we do errors and emission, e and insurance for a property manager. Um, we do general liability for contractors. Uh, we do small businesses. I do auto garages, restaurants. There is no limitations that, as to what I can or can't write. Uh, I have access to all the markets. Um, you know, I do a little bit of oil and gas, although not our specialty. I, I would say our specialty and our niche is more real estate focused um, and, you know, finding ways to drive your property insurance rates down. So uh, yeah, there's nothing that we can't write. Okay, all right. So the next part, I do have a disclaimer before we start our presentation. 
is uh, all information contained here in this is deemed liable, but not assured. We are not attorneys and cannot give you legal advice. The content to follow is an opinion and not guarantees of information or performance. Real estate investment are subject to risk and loss capital. This is not an attempt to solicit anyone currently represented by a real estate broker, property care, LLC is a licensed brokerage in Texas. So going on to the, some of the items that we're gonna cover, we cover today uh, in our presentation is kind of the state of the Houston's, Houston real estate economy. Uh, industry changes after the pandemic, types of policies you need, uh, why flood insurance is important, how to properly file a claim. And I'm gonna take the first part and I think Haytham uh, afterwards is gonna continue on with the insurance portion. Uh, kind of tidbit about me is that I, you know, Haytham and I we were talking about this before we started our presentation was that I don't know anything about insurance. So this, this presentation is just as valuable for me as anyone else that's watching at the same time. Uh, as far as the Houston real estate economy has been going is that it's been amazing, uh, meaning home sales have really surged, um, you know, and I'm definitely one of those people that always kind of try to understand why real estate sales have gone through the roof. Uh, and I think the reason mainly, and I can, I can positively say this, confidently say this, is that interest rates are so low. Uh, I think I was just looking at bank rate today and rates are under 3% for owner occupied properties. Uh, I'm helping an investor right now buy a property. And I think he's getting three and a quarter for a real estate investment property, which is an unbelievable rate. Uh, it just means that, you know, your monthly costs when interest rates are a lot lower, you can just buy a lot more house than you would normally could if interest rates were double. Uh, I think when I last bought my residential house, I was at six and a quarter. So, I mean, it's half that uh, from 10 years ago when I bought my last one. Um, and the second bullet point is basically says that, you know, the, the, the homes of prices being, the home prices being sold right now has also increased also. And again, what I've come to find out doing a lot more retails recently is that people don't really focus on the price of the house that they're buying. They're just focused on the monthly cost related to it. So, you know, if, if they can afford $2,000 a month, uh, before they could only buy a 200, this is just an example, they could buy a $200,000 house. Now they could buy, potentially buy a $350,000 house just because the interest rates are lower. Uh, at the same time though, um, you know, home prices have increased, but a lot of people have actually kind of due to the pandemic have kind of not decided not to sell their houses. So inventory, of houses within Houston are actually pretty low. Um, from my experience, just helping buyers right now, you know, if you, if there's anything worth on the market worth buying, uh, everything's going to multiple offers, uh, getting sold, and it's it's going pretty quick right now. Hey, I didn't know if you had anything to add to that on your side in regards to insurance. How does that? How does home prices affect? I guess the cost of insurance, or does are you guys focused on replacement costs or like sales prices? Yeah, it, it really focused on the square footages and replacement cost and, you know, the type of upgrades that you have in there and what, what you really want to ensure. Uh, but I agree with you, man. The, the, the market is so tight right now. Uh, we're getting a lot of these California investors, you know, making cash offers, these venture capitalists just, just dumping a bunch of money on these houses, paying over asking price. Uh, and I agree with you 100%. If there's a deal out there, um, you probably want to jump on it. And, and with the interest rates so low, they're giving money away, um, you know, and, and your out of pocket cost up front, um, you know, despite the fact if you're doing construction or not is low. And, you know, to, uh, <clears throat> to what Jerry said, you can get a lot more house uh, for less out of pocket. And, and now is the time uh, because the appreciation is rising vastly. Okay. So, on to our next one, um, you know, as everyone's aware, we're now, we're still in the middle of, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, from an insurance perspective, uh, how does that affect people getting insurance uh, or does it at all? It affects a lot. Uh, and, and people, you know, most consumers 
don't really see the behind the scenes of insurance um, and, and how this affected everything was all the lawsuits, all the loss of rent lawsuits. Um, in these policies, it states that viruses and bacteria and, and pandemics are not covered, right? M the majority of policies excluded viruses or pandemics, right? Uh, if the exclusion did not show in your policy, technically that coverage is silent, okay? And that means that you are covered for it. So there's a ton of lawsuits, ton of uh, class action suits going against these insurers. And, you know, they're paying out millions and billions of dollars of litigation uh, just to fight these claims, to pay these attorneys, costs money. And what does that do? You know, it causes them to file claims on their reinsurance, which is insurance to protect the insurance company. And when in, the reinsurance cost increases, you know, those increases get handed down to the consumers on their property, on their cars, um, you know, and all that. Technically, they're saying technically homeowners rates and rental property rates should go down because with the pandemic, people aren't leaving their home as much. So the likelihood of, of damage just taking over on a property is less. Uh, but that hasn't been the case. Um, you know, we're projecting, you know, 10 to 15 and even 20 percent increases on property insurance uh, over the next year, just depending on the insurance company. <clears throat> so be prepared for our property rates to go up. Um, and they're also seeing a lot more arson cases. You know, we've seen a ton of foreclosures happening, uh, which is causing people to light their 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 houses on fire and try to capitalize on some of that claim money. Uh, so <clears throat> more arson cases that we're seeing, more lawsuits, um, you know, and when everything got shut down, it gave insurance companies a couple months to get back to the drawing board and rewrite these insurance policies, right? That's why everything was so hush-hush. Everything just shut down. They got to go back. <clears throat> and the biggest thing was workers' comp. You know, people started to realize, oh, well, if I got COVID and I could say I got it at work, I could sue my employer. Uh, so they had to reword those documents stating, you know, we're not covering the virus and pandemic, even on a workers' comp situation. Um, so a lot of behind the scenes stuff happened, uh, which ultimately will affect our rates moving forward. We are coastal. You know, we're we're in Texas. We're in Houston. We get a ton of hurricanes, ton of hailstorms. Um, you know, we already have the second highest rates in the nation. You know, if you look at your homeowner's insurance, you're paying you know, anywhere from 15 to $2,000 in Austin, Texas, they're paying 500, uh, just to give you uh, a comparison as to what they pay versus us. So uh, what happened with the pandemic is not going to help our cause in terms of, oh, my rate should go down because I didn't have a file of claim. Okay, so, you know, it, the first thing that you pointed out was that insurance policies do not cover pandemics or viruses, right, or bacteria right. and stuff. So one of the things that you know, we were talking before this was that I don't know what's in my insurance because I've actually never filed a claim. I filed a claim one time I got denied because my deductible was too high. But are there insurance policies now, now that people know that a pandemic can't happen, are there insurance policies? And then not only can a pandemic happen, but the government or, you know, our Congress or legislation can come through and say, hey, guess what? You can't evict people now either. So right. are there insurance policies that come in play where it allows people to get in a policy that will cover rent loss because the government is now allowing you to evict certain your tenants out of the property if they're not paying rent. Right. Right. And, and sort of the, you know, the way FEMA came out with, with flood options um, you know, th there will be a policy that comes out in the future that states that will cover a sub limit. They're not going to say, Hey, we're going to cover your year annual rental income uh, for this property or for these apartments. Uh, but there, there will be some form of sub limits uh, 25 to 50 K, uh, rough one second. Yep. I'll keep it down. Please. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, you know, there will be a sublimit offered policy in the future, but right now, all I would suggest is look in your policy. So you're saying, I really don't know what's covered. Go into your policy. If you have a special form, which means, you know, it's one of the better policies in Texas, and it covers anything and everything that can happen to that property minus the exclusions, okay? So go into your policy and go, go to your um, exclusion page and you can start looking and seeing what is excluded and anything outside of those exclusions technically is covered, okay? So it's about making sure you have a special form policy 
versus a named peril policy. And a named peril policy is simply, I'm naming the risk that I'm going to cover, okay? And you're only be, only covered for about 15 items. Anything outside of those 15 items, you know, is not covered. So I'll cover fire, cover water, cover wind and hail, um, but we're not covering consequential loss. So if a tree falls on your roof, we'll cover the tree damage, obviously, but if the room floods out from the rain that entered the house, we're not covering the, the water damage. Or if a fire happens, we'll cover the fire, but with all the rain or all the water that the fire station sprayed into the house, you know, more times than not, the water damage from the fire station is greater than the fire itself. So, you know, making sure you have the right policy, understanding the exclusions is, is imperative when, when searching for a policy. Okay, so potentially there could be some down the pipeline where, you know, it, you know, could get covered by rent losses, potentially. Right now, insurance companies are rewriting their docs. So if, if it was silent, it is now going to be an exclusion. And every policy that I've seen on, you know, anything commercial wise, and even on the personal line stuff uh, for, for tenant owned properties, they're, they're excluding any virus and bacteria and pandemics. Right. Okay. So, you know, going on the next one, um, we're, we're trying to figure out what type of investor are you for people who are coming in and looking for policies? Right. So I will tell you, you know, I'll give you a little bit about what kind of investor I am. So generally I buy houses with a mortgage. Um, I come under contract and then I send it over to Haytham. I'm like, Hey, Haytham, I need insurance for this house. Uh, and I'm usually reminded by my mortgage company that I need to get insurance. Right. Now, the couple of times that I paid for cash, I've completely forgotten to even get insurance, which is yeah, kind of that. scary, pretty scary to think. Um, you know, and the couple of times that I help a buyer with cash also uh, buy houses, I forgot, I've forgotten to tell them like, hey, you need to get insurance for your property. So when I do remember to get insurance, I like, hey, hey, them, can I get insurance for this policy? And I usually look for the cheapest one. So that's that's kind of how I go about as an investor. And and I'm pretty investor savvy. I, I want to imagine that I'm probably the bigger proportion of the population, like more people are like me than on the other side, where they're more safe. So maybe give a little bit of both and maybe tell me what I should be looking for uh, beyond what, I, you know, my lowest possible quote that I could get. Right. And, and to, to go on to your point, you know, even though you're that type of investor that's like, hey, we have a relationship and you know that I'm going to insure that property as if it were my house. Right. Um, and I'm not going to leave you exposed of coverage that you're unaware of uh, at the end of the day. Um, but, yeah, there are two types of investors. There's the ones that say, hey, you know, I, I don't have much invested in this property and I'm only putting 30 grand into it. And it's a 2000 square foot. I don't want, I don't want 200,000 in coverage. Uh, I, I want to, you know, go down to maybe a hundred, 150. Um, you know, there's those guys and they're just all about price. You know, I don't want to pay $1,200 a year for insurance. I'd rather pay 900. Uh, but understanding what the 900 is getting you, you know, how high your deductibles are going to be to get that price. Um, and how much risk are you willing to take? And I use the analogy, are you a blackjack player? Or are you a poker player? The majority of investors that I see from a single family standpoint are blackjack players. They're just saying, hey, I got contractors on hand. I can fix any damages. Um, you know, so I'm really not worried about low deductibles. Give me a highest deductible. Give me the lowest amount of coverage. And, you know, I don't really care about the fine line. That's what I'm seeing. Um, I'm trying to educate those investors, uh, you know, to what coverages they do have, you know, what, what they're canceling out or what they're eliminating. Uh, and how it can affect them in the future, because it seems like when that does happen and they do have a claim, they have amnesia. They're like, well, why didn't you give me this? And uh, how come you didn't add this on there? And, oh, you know, I would have paid $200 for that. You know, and, and it sounds good then, uh, but at the time you're focused more on the deal and your cash flow and uh, your bottom line, understandable. And then I have more of the safer investors who are very cautious. They want to they want to make sure that their asset is protected. You know, I'm dumping 100, 150,000 into this property. If this house burned down, what am I getting back? Uh, and how much can I maximize on a claim? You know, so there's, there's two types. And it seems like 
you know, I, I guess from a statistical standpoint, the, the riskier investors tend to file petty claims. And I'm I'm trying to to educate to where let's not use the insurance for smaller claims. Let's let's capitalize on the insurance whenever you have a, a major fire damage or a uh, you know a huge liability claim or whatever the case is. Uh, but if you have minor water that leaked into your living room and destroyed the carpet, you know, pay 300 bucks, get it demoed and put new carpet in uh, is going to be the best option for you because you don't want to be tagged as a claim filer to the insurance company. OK, uh, you want to build strong rapport. Uh, you know, the idea is to stay with a carrier for two, three years so that you have a little bit of leverage, negotiation leverage uh, in the future um, and, and not file those petty claims. Now, you know, on the safe side, those guys, they want beefed up coverages. They're willing to pay extra. They want flood insurance. Uh, they want all the bells and whistles. And, you know, a lot of times I, I try to keep it in the you know, in the middle, because sometimes they're paying for coverages that they'll never use. You know, you know, insurance company wants to insure a property for $140 a foot. Well, if that house burned down and you can build it for 105 a foot, that's all you're getting. So why not insure it for, you know, what, what your building costs are, uh, how much is it going to cost you to build, things like that, um, and finding out what the true replacement value of that property is, um, you know, and if it makes you feel better and you sleep better at night, having the extra coverage, then pay for it. Uh, but I'm trying to find a balance between the two, in between risky and safe, uh, where you're getting a beefed up policy, you're getting low deductibles, uh, and, and your costs are, are, are minimal as well. So, you know, before I ever got into real estate investing, right, I, my insurance home and auto was through State Farm. Right. Uh, other than the fact, like I said, probably because of price, what, is there was there a reason why I sh should go with you guys rather than other than price go go with you guys rather than State Farm? Other than price, um, I mean that being the number one is that I'm saving you fifty percent, right? Uh, so it's hard not to not to go on that on that note. But other than price, yes, um, you know we have a ton of investor knowledge. Uh, we understand the claims process better than most agencies out there. Uh, we're going to shop you every year. We have multiple markets to shop. Okay. You know, State Farm, they advertise well, they have a very good policy, but the companies that I'm offering may not advertise as much. They don't have commercials, but the policies are, are the same, if not better. Um, and at the end of the day, that, that's, that's your Bible. That's uh, the, the policy is what's going to hold up in court. And as long as you're getting an HO3 all risk style policy, uh, regardless of the company, um, obviously we only write A rated carriers, A and A plus rated carriers. So I'm never going to offer a company that is financially unstable or has received a ton of bad reviews. You know, I had an insurance company called American Risk Insurance. And there was one incident where my client was handicapped and he had a situation where I think the tree fell on a roof and his AC needed to be replaced. And we're talking about a $5,000 claim. And they dragged this thing on for months on and months in. And, you know, he had no AC. He couldn't do anything. The guy was in a wheelchair. We, we just paid it out of pocket because I truly felt bad for the guy. And that was the last time we offered that carrier. Um, you know, so the types of policies that you're getting is a, a reason to choose somebody outside of State Farm or Farmers. Um, and then the options that we have, uh, and going into the types of policies for investors. So you know, before we get in, uh, again, so I, I always want to kind of give you an idea on how I look at my insurance policy when you send me a quote, right? Right. So I do have a separate liability policy for all my rental properties. So this is what I do. I, I, I look, I get, you send me the quote. I look to make sure that you don't have a liability line in there. So I'm not paying for liability. And then I go to the bottom and then see what price I'm getting. And then if the price makes sense, then we bind it and we go right. for it. <laughs> right. So I guess, yeah. I guess here, I guess we'll go through the different types of policies that's within that one quote <clears throat> that you're sending my way. Definitely. Okay. So understanding, you know, if you're buying an investment property and you plan on having a tenant uh, pretty quickly, you're going to need a dwelling fire policy, which there's two different options. There's a DP one, 
which is a actual cash value policy, uh, meaning that you're getting a depreciated value. So if you do have a claim, they will come in and say, your roof is X amount of years old, your brick is this, this many years old, your carpet, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we know that you, you know, the house burned down and we're supposed to give you hundred grand, but we're depreciating it by 30%, we'll give you 70. Uh, so you wanna stay away from DP ones or anything that states actual cash value, okay? DP three simply means you're getting replacement value. We're declaring this property, 1979 home with, you know, uh, composition shingles and brick uh, as if it were brand new. Okay, we're rating it as if it were brand new because we understand that the cost of brick, the cost of wood, the cost of roofing is much greater than it was in 1979. So I know in 1979, you built that house for 120, but today to build that house, it's gonna cost every bit of 160, 170. Uh, so understanding that, right? Uh, so make sure that you have a DP3 all risk uh, form policy that has all the bells and whistles included. If you're doing construction, you will need a form of builder's risk insurance, okay? Now, if you're doing minor cosmetic, I'm just going in and I'm painting and I'm changing the granite, you know, I, I think you can stay away from a builder's risk because you're talking about a, a weak job that can be done in no time. Uh, but if you're doing some, some pretty extensive uh, construction, uh, you are planning to replace the roof, change the AC, uh, you know, add flooring, even knock some walls down and, and, and add some square footage, you want to build as risk. You can go with a three, a six month, or even a year. Uh, most of the, most of my investors get anywhere from three to six months because they're, you know, knocking out the construction pretty quickly. Um, these policies do not include general liability, just so you're aware. So what that means is, is that we'll cover the property while it's under construction. Uh, we will not cover any third party injuries. Uh, if someone were to step on a nail, things like that, right? So you get a standalone liability insurance policy to cover any civilian injuries. And here's where it gets tricky. Just because you buy a liability policy does not mean that I'm insuring the, the roofer that's on the roof that fell off or the contractor that was in there and the beam fell on his head. And you know now he has to get rushed to the hospital. It is simply covering civilian injuries, not contractors, for any, any type of third party injuries or lawsuits, okay? If, and this is where it gets tricky, if you are an investor and you're like, hey, I got the guys, and I use these guys all the time, and you know we can piece this thing together, I'm not hiring a contractor, you are in fact a contractor and you will need contractor liability, which will cover, you know, your subcontractors that, that were to get injured and things like that. Um, so you need to understand that there's a fine line. Obviously hiring a contractor who's insured and has workers comp is going to cost you a lot more to get done. You know, you may be able to get in and out on a property with 10K, you hire a you know, reputable contractor, it's gonna cost you every bit of 15 to 20, uh, but it is because you're paying for, you know, the easement of that liability, okay? So if you are, acting as the contractor and subbing everyone together, you will need some form of contractor liability because if you sell that property and the, the buyers end up suing you for whatever reason, they got injured, you know, a beam fell off a wall, whatever the case may be, you need to have some form of coverage in place. Um, if you, if the property is vacant, you know, you would need a vacant policy, although the builder's risk does have vacancy provisions, because they understand when you're done with construction, there's going to be some a time period where there's nothing being done to the house. Uh, so it's kind of tied into the builder's risk. Cost of vacant insurance is really expensive and I just don't see worth it. Um, but, the, you know, for, for an average single family investor, this is the types of policies that you're going to be transacting on a month to month basis. When you're talking about the liability policy, you know, when you hire, you were talking about specifically you're acting as your own GC, but if you're hiring like a reputable construction company, they should in theory have their own liability policy where they can lean on that. Correct. That correct. correct. And when you do that, Jerry, and that's a good point. When you do hire a contractor that is insured, you make sure that they list you as the additional insured, which is a, a binding agreement that states that you the, you know, the, the homeowner 
can call his insurance and file a claim if he left the water main on and it flooded out the entire house or if one of his guys, you know, stole something from the property. Whatever the case is that you want to make sure that you're listed on that policy. And that's what's really good about us is that they can, you know, my clients usually call me, send me a copy of their insurance. And I just call and verify that the, the policy is active because a lot of time these guys just pay for the down payment. They never make their follow up payment. It cancels, but they have a piece of paper that says they're insured for a year. And it's just that a piece of paper. So call and verify, call the agency uh, that's listed on that certificate and see if that policy is active. One. And once once it's confirmed, make sure you're listed as the additional insured. Okay. So as far as, uh, you know, I talked about this earlier where mortgage companies do, you know, there's a mortgage on the house, you're purchasing this house, they do require insurance. Right. Um, you know, the first thought that always comes to my mind is that is the, l- the lender requirements, is that like the gold standard or is that like the bare bones? You know, lately lenders have been requiring a lot of coverage, right? And, and they're going to be on more on the safe investor side, right? They want to make sure that their property and their interest to the property is covered. Understandably, uh, they, they want 100% replacement costs, um, which, you know, I, they want to make sure that there's no co-insurance clauses included, okay? And what co-insurance is, is I'm insuring it for 80% of its actual value. But if I go less than that, let's say I do decide to insure it for $60 a foot, right? You have a thousand square foot house, I'm insuring it for 60 k well, if you have a co-insurance clause in there and you do have a claim, you know, they're outside of the appreciate the depreciation included. You're also being penalized another 20 percent uh, for not being insured, insured adequately. OK, so understanding co-insurance, right, making sure it says 100 percent replacement cost versus 80 percent replacement cost or 80 uh, percent or 90 percent. So, um it, it, most most lenders right now, they are making sure that you have 100% replacement costs with no co-insurance. Um, they want to make sure that you have up to 300000 in in personal liability, um, and they want to be listed as a lender. And when you start getting into multifamily and Fannie Mae's and Freddie's, um, they just have a laundry list of, co- of coverage that they need added that is costing investors a ton of money. And it's, and it's typically coverage that you'll never use. Um, so what I'm seeing these days is these lenders are just throwing a bunch of stuff on there and saying, we want this and we're not going to write this loan otherwise. So look out for that. Right. So one of the things that in my mind that I do to decrease my insurance premium is to like max out my deductible. Do lenders have like a minimum or or maximum deductible that you can have? They do. Uh, They do. Wind and hail, you're not going to see higher than 2%. Uh, anything higher than 2%, they'll probably de- deny. And and no more than like 10,000 for all other perils, which is fire, water, anything outside of wind and hail deductibles. So uh, keep it within that threshold, 2% wind and hail, 5,000 uh, for your AOP deductible. Right. Okay. So the next one is, you know, flood insurance. I guess, you know, three years ago, this was probably one of the hottest topics uh, yeah. out there. Um, you know, I, I've never... You know, even when I started in 2011, I've, I've never bought a house that's in a flood zone. So as a result of that, I don't have flood insurance for any of my properties whatsoever. And maybe that's something we need to talk about. Um, I have no idea how much it costs. Like for my my current residence that I just purchased, I feel like I need flood insurance for it. Right. Um, but just, you know, just give us, you know, what, what should we do with flood insurance? So we figured out a good matrix with flood insurance where you know, figure out a good amount that if, if you do obtain about six inches to a foot of water, what is it going to cost to replace the baseboards, the flooring, the cabinetry uh, in the dry out, right? How much is that going to cost for a 1500 square foot property? You're only going to need about 50 to 75,000 in coverage uh, to cover, you know, the entire downstairs to replace all that we discussed uh, without any issues. I think that's more than enough money. Um, you know, unless you're just in a high end home and you have all the, you know, the, the cool gadgets and the, the expensive uh, finishes, you know, but if you're in a, an investment property, 50 to 75,000 is, is a nice threshold to cover that property. If you do have a claim, it'll, it'll cover it. No problem. Um, and that way, you know, it's going to cost you roughly anywhere from three 
to $500 a year. If you're not in a flood zone, if you are in a flood zone, uh, it's based on the elevation certificate and how high or how low the floodplains are. Um, but with constant shifts in the floodplains, you know, they're, they're remapping the zones every year. So places that were not in flood zones are now falling in the flood floodplain. Uh, and, and once the lenders get wind of it, they're immediately sending you an email or, or a document stating you need flood insurance right away or we're defaulting or, or charging you for the insurance. Um, and you never want and in, you never want a mortgage to force place insurance on you because they're going to charge you four or five times more than the average cost. Um, so and it's very unpredictable. All, all, our weather patterns are very unpredictable. You know, during hurricane season, it just it comes in bunches. Uh, you just never know if a storm is just going to loom over us for you know three four days on end we you know with all the, the construction with all the developments going on you know we really haven't stopped as a city i mean we're we're you know uh, the, the smallest biggest city out there and and we're doing a ton of construction and that really affects our drainage um you know and and how how we can flow this water and and it becomes tougher and with all the lakes and everything else um so the increase of construction all the developments the weather patterns the likelihood of a flood happening uh, like Harvey is greater and, and we're going to see more than those. And I know it was a hundred years until we saw the, the previous one. I think those numbers are going to change. I mean, I think we can start seeing those every 10 to 15 years and uh, you know, just be careful. And for three to $500, I think it's worth uh, doing it. And if you are in a flood zone, you know, FEMA is not your only option. You can go private flood. And when I say private flood, that means, you know, I'm go I'm placing my flood insurance with an insurance company and not through the government funded policy. So uh, look at those options. Private flood are, are, are pretty competitive in a lot of areas. Um, and if you have multiple properties, you can bundle all your flow flood on a package policy as well. Um, so, you know, for you, Jerry, it's something that you should look into as well. You know, if you're really not concerned about it, fine. But when we get closer to hurricane season, you know, a lot of my investors tend to get a little nervous and they're just like, yeah, let's get it and understand that flood insurance takes 30 days to take effect. So you pay me today. It is not going to be effective till January 31st. OK, unless you're closing on the deal today. So if you're buying the property, we can skip the 30 day wait period and, and get the insurance. But if you already own the property, there is a waiting process. So um, for someone that's risk averse, right? Would you would you recommend without even knowing the cost of an elevation certificate, if you're buying a new property, would you suggest someone to like, hey, just go ahead and get the elevation certificate and see get potentially get a quote for fund insurance? So I would before doing that, because elevations are cost about 500 bucks. OK, mm -hmm. before doing that, I would quote it with FEMA. Right. And, and they're going to determine it is in a flood zone. You'll see like a or a E flood zone. OK, once that's determined they'll usually give you a rate, right? And if that rate is just outrageous, you're looking at two, $3,000 and you're dead set on buying this property, you want to get an elevation cert, okay? But before doing that, check your private flood options, okay? Private flood option will be a great option there and will not require an elevation certificate if the property has never flooded before within the last five years, right? Uh, so on those qualifications, if you they find out that it has been flooded, you know, twice in the last three years, they're going to decline coverage. So if it hasn't been, it hasn't flooded in the last five years, it is in an elevation, uh, in, a, in a, a flood zone, check with private flood. If those rates are coming back higher, go ahead and get an elevation cert. It could help. And I've seen cases where it didn't help the rate. I've seen cases where it just, you know, maybe went down a hundred dollars and you're out four because you, you paid for the elevation certificate. So you know, in most cases, it should help the rate. Uh, in some cases, it doesn't. So on moving on, uh, how to file a claim. So as I told you before, I, I had State Farm. I filed a claim one time. And, um, you know, it's, you know, you get those State Farm commercials where, you know, the guy just appears. And, uh, Chris Paul. <laughs> yeah, Chris Paul. And unfortunately, in this situation, they couldn't help me. Um, that, that was my loan experience. Uh, so I think I reached out to my insurance agent and, you know, like the so state farms was state farm. So all the insurance there. So I know you guys, you guys are an insurance broker. 
right? So you, so there's multiple lines of insurance. Like maybe you want to tell us the difference between those, what you guys do versus State Farm. And then, at, and then after that, how do I file a claim? Do I have to go to the insurance, the actual insurance provider, or do I go to you guys when I need to file a claim? Okay. Uh, so unlike a State Farm, we are a brokerage. Uh, we offer a, a wide variety of, of business. We can write a ton of businesses. Um, we do you know, home, we do auto, we do dwelling fires, we do builder's risks. Um, th there's no limitations as to what we can and can't write. Um, and that, that is really what separates us from a state farmer or farmers is that, you know, they only offer select products and it's typically home and auto and a little bit of commercial, but not much. Right. Um, and, and everyone is so dead set on name. Um, and, you know, they, they have great commercials, but like you said, my deductible is too high and they ultimately denied that claim. And, you know, we're offering policies that, you know, we're keeping your deductibles low and we're still saving you money in the process where it's a win-win. Uh, so that that's really what separates us from, from your state farms. And also even with the state farm, I, I'm sure the experience was, he gave you the 1-800 number, you called. Um, and, and that was kind of that, you know, you, you got, got the bad news broken. Now, you know, if it were I that you called and were, were saying, hey, I'm, I'm ready to file a claim, the first thing I'm checking is that deductible. And I'm saying, hey, Jerry, you know, send me some pictures. What do we got? You know, let's assess the damage and see how much you really have, right? Well, you know, you were out of town and there was a little leak and, you know, maybe there's some sheetrock damage that we can kind of beef the claim up, so to speak, right? Um, so really assessing that damage before you call, you call and file that claim. Because now when you file that claim and you don't reach the deductible, that claim is on your record and your rates are going to go up next year because you lost the claim free discount. Uh, you filed a claim, even though it was a zero payout to pay an adjuster to come out, cost four or five hundred bucks. Uh, the processing, you know, it was still every bit of three to four thousand dollars just processing that claim. So even though there was nothing paid out, there was still money cost or cost occurred. Uh, to that claim. So you're going to be penalized that in the future. So make sure you assess the damage, understand, you know, the cause of loss, when it happened, what was damaged, take pictures, you know, keep a, a detailed uh, spreadsheet of any items or personal property that's damaged as well uh, with hyperlinks of what it cost, right? If your house flooded out due to a pipe leak, you know, and all your clothes was ruined, you know, you need, you need to go ahead and log everything that was damaged and make sure that you get paid for that as well. When using, and, and that's, that's the difference, right? You call me, I'm going to walk you through that. And I'm going to say, Hey, Jerry, you probably shouldn't file it because your claim, your deductible 7,000 to replace that roof is going to be 8,000. It's not worth it. Right. And that would save you an increase in the, in the following year. Um, then let's just say you do have enough damage and you know, you're looking at a 20 or $30,000 claim. You don't want to hire just an average guy to come in and say, yeah, yeah, I could do that for four. You know, insurance companies really don't don't do that. If you find a find a guy that says he can do it for four and send you an invoice for four, they're going to give you a check for four. Uh, you want to use a contractor that uses Xactimate. And Xactimate is the same software that the insurance companies use to determine replacement cost, right? And every line item is is essential when doing it because there's so many different line items that you're not privy to. Uh, there is a line item for removing your outlet switch. There's a, a line item for adding that outlet switch. There's a line item for two coats of paint and seal. There's a line item for, you know, removing furniture. There's a line item for dumpster. All those things come into play. And when you use a contractor that has claims and Xactimate experience, we're, we're throwing in a ton of those line items that, that we actually need, right? So I can take a ten, fifteen thousand dollar estimate that the insurance gave me, and I could turn it into a thirty, like that, with legitimate line items that need to be paid for. Okay, so make sure you find the right contractor, um, and when you do hire that contractor, try to get him to have that estimate ready. And you're doing all this within a three to five day period, because typically the insurance company will come out, you know, in a week or two. And that happens, you want to have your contractor out there to talk to the adjuster, to point out these line items saying, hey, well, you missed this and you missed that. Um, and, and 
get them to approve a lot of the things that we see that need to be done. Um, and, and by taking this process, by, by having a step-by-step -step on your claim, I'm telling you nine out of 10 of my clients that have, have benefited from our claims consulting service have won. And it's because you're prepared. And, and the process is for, for most consumers, oh, I got a claim. Let me call and file a claim. File a claim. I wait on the adjuster. Adjuster comes out. He gives me the finger, says he's not going to cover it. And then I, I feel like, what the hell have I been paying for for the last five, 10 years? You know, and and that's where it kind of cuts deep. So if you follow the steps uh, of doing it correctly and, and you're prepared for that adjuster meeting, you have your estimate ready. You're not waiting for him to give you an estimate. You're saying this is what you owe me. Um, and when they see that you, you've done your homework, that you understand the process, it, it, they're less likely to try to take advantage of you. I saw a woman who spoke no English after Hurricane Ike and her, her home was just damaged, man. I'm, I mean, she had at least $100,000 to $130,000 in damage. Place had to be completely remodeled and they gave her 40,000. Well, this woman thought she hit the jackpot. She was like, oh my God, $40,000. Well, once she got going and contractors were going, they were done with the 40,000 in the first two weeks. And they're like, hey, we can't finish this job otherwise. So, um, you know, making sure that you're prepared, making sure that you have uh, people on your team, you know, like an agency who understands that process is that's gonna walk you through it. Uh, and if this insurance company is just dead set on denying your claim, that's when we go a little bit further. You never stop at the problem. And that's where I, I see a lot of, a lot of uh, investors are just like, ah, that's insurance. Well, let me hire a public adjuster. Let's get a second opinion. And, and a public adjuster is just someone that protects you in the event of that claim. Okay. Um, you know, and even having restoration companies come out and dry your house out. You know, when, when a hurricane hits, you don't want to be last on that list. You don't want to be you know, when a catastrophe like that happens, there's only so many resources. You want to have people in your network. So no contractor, no a restoration company, know your agents and make sure that you're on top of that list when that hurricane hits. So let me let me ask you real quick. I see on there that you're 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 referencing using a public adjuster. Right. And then right. you also said that you, you guys do claims consulting services. Is that right. one in the same or. It is. OK, it is. It okay. is. And I'm glad you pointed that out. Essentially. You know, you're getting a public adjuster when you have a contractor that has claims experience without the 10 percent fee. Right. Okay. But a lot of times these public adjusters have attorneys that they use to, you know, send attorney letters to try to get them to, to bite a little harder. Uh, so, that you know, there's certain methods. But if you're using a contractor that has claims experience, I think you're, you're in there. It's in your best of interest to go that route. Okay, so when we get a policy with you guys, the consulting service slash claim adjuster process is included within, or is that an additional service that you guys provide? Can you repeat that question? So when you're talking about your consulting slash public adjuster service, right? Right. Is that just a benefit that we get by having a policy with you guys? Or is that a, another benefit that we have to, or no. additional costs? No added charge. Um, as you know, you know, and I, I don't solicit this at all, but we in our building, we have benchmark insurance downstairs is Rice Construction, which is um, a, a reputable construction company that, that we also own. Uh, so basically, we're sending our guys to give you that estimate and we're not soliciting the construction. Take our estimate. You have paid for it because you're you're a value client of ours through benchmark and use that to protect you and hire whatever contractor you want. In most cases, they want to hire us. We don't do much residential work these days. Um, so we're just going to go, go, go on ahead and give you that estimate, which is, you know, typically costs about $500. If you, if you ask a contractor to give you an exact amount estimate, it takes a lot of hours. Uh, it's going to cost you about four or 500 bucks. So, you know, use that to your advantage and you, and it's a free added service for benchmark clients. Okay. Um, you know, as we're wrapping up here, you know, you know, I, I like to say, I, I refer you guys out quite a bit. Um, I never just refer you guys, but I refer, you know, some additional insurers and more often than not, a lot of people do go to you guys. Uh, I think that just kind of sure. speaks to the service that you guys provide. Haven't really ha ever heard any issues. The reason why I always give options is that I don't want to be caught if something does go wrong. Again, nothing, I've never, never, no one's ever come back to me with any bad feedback in regards to benchmark insurance, which is, 
you know, Thank that's you. why I keep referring you guys. Now, if someone ever came back and said like, hey, Benchmark did this, uh, I think, you know, I may have a different response. In addition to that, uh, I do you guys do use you guys personally, not only for my rental properties, but I do you guys for my commercial car leases. Right. Uh, and as you said, you guys do beyond that, you know, business. What, what are all the things that you insure? Just, just to let people know. Let you know, I, I do a ton of multifamily. I do a, a lot of apartment complexes. I specialize in investor packages for single family uh, investors that have, you know, multiple properties. So if you have four, five, 10, 20 properties, let's consolidate all those on a commercial policy. Uh, we have, you know, you can have an unlimited amount of additional insureds. You know, if you have partnerships and, you know, wrap loans and subject twos, it can all be added on there. Uh, and it just makes it easier to manage your insurance every year and not have to worry about, oh crap, I have 10 different policies, 10 different renewal dates, 10 different flood coverages, um, consolidating and saving that time and money. Um, I do retail shopping centers. I do storage units. I just did a car wash. Um, I do restaurants, nightclubs, um, contractors. I do contractor liability for developers. Um, I do a steel erection company. Um, I insure horses. <laughs> uh, I mean, you name it, I can do it. Um, if there's something that you're looking for, and again, my niche is property, right? I, I really like the fact that I can, you know, go through the markets and, and negotiate property rates. And what I do is not, I'm not taking your information and saying, Hey, how much, how much can I get this for? I'm going in with a story. I'm building a narrative around that client. I'm saying, Hey, here's Jerry. He owns 10 single family properties. He has not filed a claim one time in, in eight years. Um, total coverage is about $2 million. You know, he's paying 10,000. If you give me at eight, I'll lock in his business right now. Right. So I'm, I'm guaranteeing that I'm securing the business. I'm, I'm coming out with a target price up front. Right. That way we're, ain't, we're not wasting time. I'm not saying, Hey, Oh, can you do it for eight? And they say no. And then it was just wasted time. So I'm saying, if you can do it for eight, great. We'll lock in the business. And that's when I come to my clients and say, Hey, look, uh, you know, you're paying 11,000. I got you at eight. Let's lock it in. And then we'll, you know, we'll reconfigure next year. Right. And it's just a better approach uh, for you to save money from a 10 year standpoint. Like we're looking at, at it from a 10 year. I don't want you for one year or two years. I want to show you in 10 years, you know, that I can save you every bit of 20, 30, 40% over that span. Um, and there's value there and, and on top of the added services. So anything property related, um, I really insure and, you know, I'm more than happy to help anyone. Hey, hey, them. Hey, you know, thank you for your time. Uh, you know, taking the time out and you know out of your busy schedule, and thank come so and speak with us on here. Uh, you know, like like I said before, benchmark insurance. You guys are locally right here in Houston, correct? Yes. Uh, I consider you guys local experts. Uh, you know, at Property Care, we have multiple numerous clients that actually use you guys also. So we have a mutual relationship or mutual clients uh, between the two of us. Um, I've only had heard good things. You know, what's funny is that I think our most recent accident, which, which was the one uh, we, we had a mutual client, this just came to my mind was that the lady, we had a client where we had a water company turn on water and she, she had her flood, uh, her house flooded for three days before we even knew wow. that it was, it was, it was our mutual client. And I right, think right, right. she came out pretty well. It was, it was up in the Tascacita. I remember uh, that. Yes. Yes. That, and these are situations where, you know, the point out is that, you know, you never know when you need insurance. Uh, never in my mind, this is, you know, out of turning water for properties, over a thousand properties. This is the first time we ever had a water company turn on, let the meter, the meter is running and it flooded the whole house for three days. Hot water come from the water heater. Right. And you guys, I think she came out pretty happy with that situation. That's awesome. That's all. And really that's, that's what you want, man. That's what, you're paying for insurance every year. And I, I want to deliver on that, right? I just want to make sure that that experience, that one claim that you had in 10 years was a, a good experience. And for that, that gives us a good reputation. They know that, you know, we have their best interest in mind and we know what the hell we're doing at the end of the day. Right. All right, Haytham, uh, I got to go here, but have a good one. We need to catch up soon. Uh, yes, talk to you again soon. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me and uh, look forward to the next one. Okay. All right. Thank you.